The legendary Rosemary, today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another sizzling episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Today is part two of my four-part conversation with the legendary Rosemary, best known to us for playing Sally on the Dick Van Dyke Show. Now, this was one of my favorite interviews that has never seen the light of day. Today, she talks about coming to Los Angeles, working for Bugsy Siegel before anyone knew what Las Vegas was, or even would become, and Jimmy Durante. First up, though, Rosemary talks about how she met her husband, the legendary trumpeter, Buddy Guy. Well, I met my husband, who was in the Army at the time. He was with Kay Kaiser's orchestra before the uh, Army, and uh, I was going to open at the Capitol Theater in New York. And uh, there was a, a, a club in, in Newark, New Jersey. I wish I could think of the name right now. Frank Daly's Meadowbrook. And uh, all the bands used to play there, all the big bands. And so my husband had played there many times. Well, now he's in the Army. And uh, they had a radio, sh radio line. In those days, the band, if they got a radio line, it was a big thing. Because here we are at the terrace room with Frank, you know, and so forth and so on. So... Uh, there was a guy, the orchestra was uh, uh, Mal Hallett, big name, Mal Hallett. And he had the, the the band there at the Meadowbrook. Well, he had all kids because all the good guys were in the army, you know. And my husband came down to play the radio show. So it would, because the first trumpet player is the sergeant of the band, so to speak. So he came down and his friend, uh, Joe Shribman said, you want to make 50 bucks tonight? And I said, well, of course, you know. So he said, just go down and do the radio show. So he came down and did the radio show and sat at the uh, bar and, uh, on the side that was the uh, workers' bar. And I came up through there to go do my show. I was breaking in a new show for the Capitol Theater in New York. And we started talking, and he told me that he was from Trenton, I was from from Jersey, we were. F he knew my uncle. He knew this. He knew all about me, and and all that. And I said, fine. And I said, oh, oh, oh. Sergeant, you know, he's a nice guy. He was Mickey Rooney's uh, best man at the second wedding, when they were both in the army. And he started talking about that. And, he, and I said, What band were you with? He said, Kay Kaiser. And I went, Oh God, at least Glenn Miller or something, you know, Kay Kaiser. Yeah. Anyway. I went and did my second show, and then uh, he still was up there. And we sat down and had a cup of tea, and, and uh, he said, don't you want to drink? I said, I don't drink. And he said, neither do I. He said, let's have a cup of tea. I said, great. And we had a cup of tea, and we started talking. And I did my second show, and I said, I got all new gowns and all new arrangements, because it was New York. It was the Capitol Theater in New York, you know. So um, I got a telephone call the next day at my house, and it said, uh, saw your act at the Meadowbrook, and uh, you need new gowns or new material, and signed Casper for Nittenbaum. And I said, there must be that dizzy sergeant, you know. So I came in the next night to go to work, and I said, I got your, your telegram, Casper. And he said, did you know it was me? And I said, yeah. And we started talking and stuff. And my girlfriend, who used to do my hair, came down with me that night, and uh, she met him, and uh, I did my show, and went downstairs to change, and come up and do the second show. And I said, you see the sergeant up there? She says, yeah. I said, I'm going to marry him. She said, you only met him two days ago. I said, that's the man I'm going to marry. She said, you know nothing about him. I said, doesn't matter. I'm going to marry him. You who won't go out on double dates or this or anything, you're going to marry that fat sergeant? I said, he's not a fat sergeant. You know, so anyway, uh, he asked me out after I closed, and we started courting, so to speak. And uh, he asked me to marry, he asked me to marry him. We went to the Meadowbrook to watch Gene Krupa, and he said to me, you know, I get out of the Army in June. He says, and I have to go back to California because everything is in California, my clothes, my horns, this and that. 
And he says, working with Kay, I left everything out in California. And he says, if you want to stick with me till then, fine. That was my proposal. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'll stick with you. Fine. And uh, he got out of the army. And June the 19th, my parents hated my mother. My mother liked him very much. But my father was losing his bread and butter, so he was worried. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I didn't like my father, just so you know. And uh, my mother was, uh, was Polish and very easy to convince anything. And he used to lie to her about my husband. And so she would believe it. Then she'd ask me and I'd say, that's not true. We went back and forth like that for about half a year until he got out of the army. And I said, the only way we're gonna do this is we gotta, gotta elope. So we eloped. And we drove out, uh, I had about $1,500 in the bank, which was a lot for me because my father kept all the, the money. Even my mother didn't get it. But uh, I had about $1,500 in the bank. And I said, and he had $268 mustering out pay. That was it. And so we went to a friend of mine and I, I bought a used car. He said, don't tell your father you bought the car here. <laughs> I said, don't worry. So we bought the car, it was a Mercury. And we, we started out and I, I had friends all across the country from working there, you know, working to different towns. And stuff. So I called my friend Judy Applebaum. I said, I just got married. She said, oh my God. And she said, you coming to Philadelphia? I said, yeah. She said, all right, we'll throw you your dinner, you know. And so we went to Philadelphia and spent my wedding night at the Philadelphia Hotel. <laughs> I used to live there when I was working in Philly. So they were very nice. They gave us the bridal suite for nothing. <coughs> I get choked up when I think of Philadelphia. <laughs> don't we all? Yeah, don't we? Yeah. And uh, so uh, Joe, her father, was in the rental of cars and things like that. And he said, you're going to drive out to California? We said, yes. Neither one of us had a job or anything. And he said, uh, let me look over the car. So he looked over the car, put new tires on, fixed the whole thing on. He said, that's my wedding present. Her mother gave us $250 and said, you don't need a piece of silver. You need this more than anything for your wedding. And Judy gave me 200 So we had a little money. We stopped whenever we wanted to stop. We drove out to the coast. Neither one of us knowing what the hell we were going to do when we got out here. We went to a friend of his who owned a kennel, and we were very much involved with dogs, or they were very... My husband was given a boxer, a doctor friend of his, before he went into the Army, divorced his wife, and for spite, gave this dog to Bobby because he loved him so much. The dog was the first boxer in America. It was worth $7,500 at that time. Every boxer today comes from that, that one boxer. He was the first one here. So th these people were friends of Bobby's, and we, I lived in a kennel for about uh, a month and a half, something like that. And uh, he went down, we got there on a Monday, and he went down Tuesday to NBC to see Kay Kaiser, and Kay says, go in the bag, you start tomorrow. And he was, you know, and so he hadn't touched a horn in quite a while, and he was worried, and, uh, but he played the show, and he, was, he had a job, you know. So we got started little by little, and uh, I would go and buy, uh, open a charge account and buy silverware and little things, you know. And a uh, friend of his was going with Glenn Gray's orchestra, and he said, why don't you rent our house? So we rented their house. And we lived there for about two or three months, and then we got a house on the GI loan. Gee, what a story this is. This is amazing. <laughs> and. Uh, we just started to, to go, and then I got a call uh, from, from a friend of mine who said, you better get an agent out here. And I said, okay. And I'm known as Rose Marine now. I dropped the baby. Well, the East Coast never knew what the West Coast was doing, and the West Coast never knew what the East Coast was doing. So nobody had ever heard of me. And here in New York, I was a big star. I played the Cope at the Chapery, the Palmer House in Chicago, and, uh, uh, Latin Quarter, and you name it. I played all the big spots, you know, all the big nightclub spots. But nobody ever heard of me out here. So 
I said I had given up show business to prove to my family that uh, my husband was not out to take my money, what money I had. I didn't have any. And uh, so I got some calls about going to work. My agent called me and he said, Abbott and Costello want you for a hospital tour. I said, I can't do it. I have no gowns. I have no music. I have nothing. He said, you're turning down $2,500. I went, oh, God. I said, well, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to work. He says, come in the office. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So the both of us went into the office, and he said, you're married. You've proved your point. Now go out and make some money. He says, in five years, you can do this to everybody. He says, you're not proving a thing. You've, you've proven that you're married and so forth and so on. I'm turning down dates like crazy. He said, they want you back at the Capitol. They, I said, I have no gowns. I have no music. I didn't take any of that stuff. He said, well, you can always get gowns and you can always get new music. So George Dooning, who was Kate Kaiser's arranger, he said, I'll do your music for you. So he did that. And I called up my dressmaker in New York, Baron Von Waldeck. What a great guy. He says, I got your gowns here. Because I used to bring them to him to clean, repair. And he says, I got your gowns here. Your father came to get them. He says, they're not your gowns, they're hers. And uh, he sent them out to me, so I had my gowns. And uh, I played Slapsy Maxies out here when it was a big, big place to go. And uh, the reviews were remarkable. They were just wonderful. It was like, uh, Rosemary, we love you. Where have you been? You know, things like that. And uh, I became known, you know, as a, as a comedian and singer. So. And then uh, Billy Wilkinson from the Hollywood Reporter called and said, uh, like, you go to Vegas. I said, what, 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 what's Vegas? He says, we're opening up a new club there. Then the show is Xavier Cougat, Jimmy Durante. And I said, Jimmy Durante, because I used to do an impression of Durante. Not that I was an impressionist, I, I never claimed to be, but Jimmy and I were so close, and, and I used to tease him by doing him, and then he would show me how to do him. He'd say, put your hands over here, and do this, and do that, you know. So I used to do a little bit in my act, you know. I just wasn't a singer, so to speak. So um, he said, Jimmy Durante, and we'd like to have you. I said, I'm coming. Now, I'm five months pregnant. And my gowns still fit because I only gained 11 pounds. I wish I could say that now. And uh, anyway, my husband said, fine. Because now he was set. He was doing a lot of shows and he was doing, he was doing well, you know. And uh, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this date. He said, you're five months pregnant. I said, I don't show it. The gowns fit. I can do it. I'm not, I don't, I'm not jumping over hurdles, you know. So uh, uh, I played the Flamingo with uh, Jimmy Durante and Xavier Cougat and myself. That was the first show at the Flamingo, and I worked for Bugsy Siegel. The movie of Bugsy Siegel is not all correct. They said that they closed after we closed. That's not so. Three or four acts came in afterwards, but that's another part of it. So I'm there, and and... People were afraid to come to this place because it was like Monaco with the guys on high chairs or croupiers on high chairs and, and all this. And, you know, Vegas at that point had two places, the El Rancho and, um, and uh, Last Frontier. And it was all, you know, boots and you know what I mean. And they were afraid of this place because this was neons and lights. My God, it was unbelievable. And Xavier Cougat and his orchestra and, and Jimmy Durante, my God. You know. So very, nobody, I mean, this was late, I, I'm jumping. Willie Wilkinson became friends with Bugsy Siegel because the mob wouldn't give Bugsy any more money. They didn't, they didn't trust him. He had, they had sent him two million and he went over that. Well, two million in 1946 was a lot of money. So they said, you're barking up the wrong tree. You don't know what you're doing, you know. So Billy Wilkinson said, I'll give you the money that you need. We're partners and so forth and so on. Now, Billy Wilkinson is head of a trade paper in California, Hollywood Reporter. He calls me up and he says, we want you to go to Vegas. And I said, what's Vegas? 
and he said, we're doing a show at the Flamingo, what's the Flamingo? It's a new club that we're opening in, I said, in Vegas? He says, yeah, he said, with Jimmy Durante. I said, I'm going. That's all I had to hear was Jimmy Durante. I said, I'm going. So the night I was supposed to fly up, let's say it was Monday, it rained. Well, the one plane that went to Vegas didn't take off. And my husband said, you're not going to drive. I don't want you in a car. You, you'll fly tomorrow. I said, we open tomorrow. He said, it'll be all right. So we opened. I went on the plane the next day, and everybody was on the plane. And Jimmy says, uh, we're going to do a little something at the end. I said, okay, fine, whatever you want to do. So we get in there. Now, the Flamingo had no rooms, only had the uh, coffee shop, the dining room, and the casino. There were no rooms. Everybody stayed at the El Rancho. So we rehearsed and we did this show and, and Billy Wilkinson flew in every star in Hollywood from top to bottom. Clark Gable, Joe Crawford, Lana Turner, you name them, they were there for the opening. Well, nobody was going to refuse Billy Wilkinson. And we had a crowd of stars for the opening night and it was tremendous. And Jimmy and I did a bit at the end, which today would be unbelievable, you know. He would be do. I did my act, and then he would come out, <coughs> excuse me, and do his act. And I would come out, and I'd say, stop the music, stop the music. And he'd say, there's an imposter here, and I don't know which one of us is us, you know. <laughs> and that's the way we started. And then we finished off together. So it was, it was really, I have to say this, it may sound conceited, but it was one of the greatest things you've ever seen. So then the next night the stars were there and oh, we had a ball and it was gambling and fun and everything. The next day the stars went home. We had nine people for the show that night. And can you imagine Jimmy Durante working to nine people? He didn't get enough applause to go off the stage. And we played two weeks. That's it for now. Next time, Rosemarie continues to talk about her encounters with Bugsy Siegel in 1940s Vegas, lunch with Al Capone, plus her start in TV, The Dick Van Dyke Show, and her relationship with Maury Amsterdam and Mary Tyler Moore. It's going to be good. I'm David Levin. See you then. And please subscribe to Pop Goes the Culture.